Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and welcome back to those of you both in person and online who joined us for a rich conversation on research priorities this morning. Thanks also to those of you just joining us now for the afternoon presentation and discussion. For those of you who missed the morning session, my name is Lawrence Alexander, Chancellor of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff and Chair of the Board for International Food and Agricultural Development, or BIFAD. This afternoon, we're here to learn more about a new report commissioned by BIFAD and developed with guidance from the BIFAD Subcommittee on Systemic Solutions for Climate Change Adaptation and Mitigation in Agricultural Nutrition and Food Systems and with research and implementation support from a BIFAD support mechanism implemented by TetraTech. The report explores pathways to operationalize USAID's climate strategy within agri-food systems policies and programming to help the agency meet its ambitious strategy targets. The purpose of this afternoon's program is to discuss the key findings from the report, the subcommittee's preliminary recommendations to the board, and impl imp implications of these recommendations for USAID and implementing partners. Following presentations from subcommittee members, we will move to stakeholder feedback and public comments to inform the subcommittee's ultimate recommendations to buy that. We look forward to an engaging dialogue with our audience members, both those of you joining online and those in the room here today. Please make note of your questions or comments throughout the report presentation and panel discussion that follows. We'll have a public question and answer comment period following the panel. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce once again USAID's Chief Climate Officer, Gillian Caldwell, to share framing remarks for this afternoon's discussion. Let's welcome Gillian back to the podium. All right. Hope everybody enjoyed their break and or lunch. I had a very fruitful conversation that digressed in fabulous ways and led us back to some important conclusions, which I won't share with you now because I have some other things to talk about. Um, to those of us just joining us uh, for the afternoon, welcome. And to the rest of you who are here this morning, welcome back. Um, as I mentioned this morning, I really do again want to acknowledge Administrator Power in Abstentia for challenging uh, us and BIFAD to take up the charge to really think about how we can get to a whole of agency strategy and impact when it comes to um, the food and uh, intertwined climate security crisis. Um, and I want to again thank the, Bi, uh, the BIFAD, BIFAD and the subcommittee for really participating in what I hope will be an ongoing and vibrant dialogue uh, this afternoon. Particular thanks to Lini Wallenberg and Dr. Aaron Coughlin Perez for co chairing the subcommittee. Um, it's been a lot of work, it's nearly 100 pages. Um, I wasn't able to read it all this morning, but um, I did get through some of it, and I'm gonna highlight a couple of key points that I think they made that really resonated with me. Um, but before I do so, just three quick um, observations um, and, and sort of issues that I think need to underlie the report uh, writ large. Um, one which everybody discussed this morning is the need for ambitious action. It goes without saying. Um, incidentally, if we're going to have ambitious action, we need ambitious resourcing to deliver on that action. We are not where we need to be. State and AIDS combined climate budget is 1% of the total state USAID budget, just to give you some sense of where we are in terms of prioritization on that front. So we need the ambition. Um, and uh, in, in fact, when I arrived um, as a political appointee in August of 2021, we were in the late stages of shaping, uh, finalizing the strategy, which had been a highly participatory process. And I urged everybody to be as ambitious as possible with the targets. The targets did get more ambitious in the ensuing months, partially because 
I gave per people per some permission to fail. I said, I don't want targets we're going to blow past. We shouldn't be going for low-hanging fruit. We, we've got to reach here. We need an ambitious but achievable reach. And that's where I think we are right now with these targets. Um, secondly, again, hackneyed phrase, transformational change. I mean, we toss this term around a lot, but we really do need it. And in fact, the climate crisis demands a fundamental reinvention of how we're living our lives every day in the entire global economy. So talk about transformational change. It's a pretty important opportunity. And as grim as the prospects are, if we don't take action, the future could look pretty bright if we did. And we could address a lot of the inequities that um, are uh, so embedded in our existing economy. Um, and then also, again, another hackneyed phrase, systemic change to address these current and uh, future challenges. Um, the strategy itself has a series of uh, direct action targets and an entire category of systems changing interventions to get the right signals um, to the economy and the right policies and regulations in place to um, really catalyze and help us go further and faster as we, as we so much need to. Um, so I wanted to just, as I promised, to highlight a couple of uh, things I read uh, in that executive summary of the report that really uh, struck, a, struck a nerve. And um, I think you know, it actually sort of further reinforces the call to action the uh, administrator um, issued to BIFAD because um, she knows that we aren't moving further uh, f far enough and fast enough in these areas. And I, I think you know, if you read the report, you'd see that the subcommittee agrees. Um, one of the things they said is that operating units at USAID continue to treat climate change largely as a risk to programming rather than an imperative for action. And I would add to that an opportunity for action, right? Because if we really keep equity in mind, the sky's the limit in terms of what we can achieve with our interventions and our development goals. So that's number one. The second thing they said, and again, not trying to denigrate anybody in this room and the hard work they've done on the research front, but the BIFAD uh, subcommittee found that USAID supported research also has not generated the systemic evidence, approaches, and products needed to address climate impacts on agriculture and food security. So that's a call to action, right? How can we do even better with the research that we're underwriting. Research that's so critically important that has already undoubtedly helped the lives of millions, but could do more um, to help us tackle the crisis. They also had a couple of um, key recommendations. Um, quite surprisingly, I thought, um, and importantly, they articulated recommendations as to how much the agri-food work should contribute towards core climate strategy targets. So we have a goal to reduce uh, carbon emissions in our strategy by 6 billion metric tons. That's one and a half all US emissions in 2021. So it's a, it's a, it's a substantial target. And their recommendation is that uh, emissions from agri-food should be reduced by 1.2 gigatons per year between now and 2030. That should be the North Star for our interventions on agri-food. They don't tell me what the baseline is, but thought it was pretty interesting they did that calculation. They also recommended that there be a goal to catalyze 36 billion of the 150 billion target through agri-food interventions. And finally, they think that um, the agri-food work should have a goal to reach 180 million people of the 500 million target through increased um, adaptation and resilience. So really worth um, digging into those recommendations and, and kind of analyzing the viability uh, and uh, appropriateness of, of those as we, as we dig deeper. Finally, now this is a if I may, a very USAID style sentence, meaning you, you know, have to focus to hear what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to read it to you because this is, this is actually like, this, is, this gives you a sense of how exciting my life is. This sentence really resonated with me. You ready? Effective operationalization of the climate strategy within USAID's agri-food portfolio require, requires significant organizational change. Now, here we go. This should include setting ambitious adaptation, mitigation, and finance targets, 
better integrating climate change goals in country development cooperation strategies, geographic priorities, projects, activities, and monitoring systems, and making climate change a priority in the agency's research investments, funding decisions, staffing, and capacity building. Big mouthful, but what I think is important here is that they're trying to get beyond the annex, right, which is sort of a subsidiary, not, not an unimportant, but not the heart of consideration when it comes to the bulk of the resourcing within USAID, which goes through missions. They're saying this, uh, this work, this, ag th this work in the agricultural industry needs to be uh, keeping climate front and center and it needs to inform the strategy itself, that uh, the country specific strategy that each uh, mission develops. And it, of course, details a whole range of places in which climate needs to be a central consideration. Um, before I, I close, I have a couple of just um, questions I think I'd love to pose to us as we move into the discussion. Um, uh, I think it's kind of, it's easy to miss the opportunities when you think about ag and food systems because it's such a big tent and there's so much terrain to cover. But um, a couple of the questions I think we, we want to ask ourselves here. One is, um, how do we produce food and agricultural goods like cotton and palm oil that go into both food and non-food products in ways that are sustainable? Um, how do we deal with livestock? This came up today. Um, very touchy subject in a lot of areas, given the importance of pastoralism from a cultural and economic perspective. But between the methane uh, livestock produce in the gut and the deforestation to generate more pasture, ruminant livestock are responsible for 50% of agriculture's greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, they're an important nutritional source. So that's a complicated terrain. How do we ensure the ecosystem services that the surrounding land and watersheds provide the families and communities who produce and cook and eat the food? We didn't hear a lot about food loss and waste this morning. What about food loss and waste, which of course drives uh, methane emissions and because we're wasting so much food, requires that we produce even more, which further catalyzes the emissions we're worried about. What recommendations, we touched on this this morning, do we have for what people eat and their diets? Again, highly sensitive cultural conversation um, for all kinds of reasons, um, but such critical impacts, not just on personal nutrition and health, but the, the global carbon footprint and the long-term uh, experience people will have living their lives in um, uh, what will be uh, the hotter and hotter summer to come. That was really pretty startling this morning when he said it, this last year was, this last summer was the hottest summer you've ever experienced and from now on it'll be the coldest. That's pretty hectic. Um, uh, and then finally, how do we analyze critically important policies that can create or limit growers' access to land, water, finance, technical assistance, and markets? And here we need to think about the gender dimension of our interventions. As we talk about uptake, it's so often women are so critical to these agricultural food systems and we don't have enough uptake from women and we're not considering the disproportionate and often negative impacts our policies can have on women in more marginalized communities. Um, so yeah, I, I think focusing uh, on equity to ensure that um, you know, the institutions and norms that determine who can access land and markets and seed and water uh, keep equity front and center, and finance, right? We've got a 600% gap in climate finance right now. We need three to five trillion dollars a year for our mitigation and adaptation needs combined by 2030, 600% increase on where we are right now. So even if developed economies make good on the 100 billion that we must and should, that we promised under the Paris Agreement, it's still a fraction of the total need and we're not gonna get there without private sector engagement. That's why we have our private sector call for adaptation under uh, President Biden's PREPARE initiative. So we need to think about ways to stimulate private sector investments in innovations and agri-food systems and uh, the, the aim for climate initiative which was referenced this morning with the UAE is a great example of what we can do uh, if we put our mind to it. So yes, as we head towards um, 
This afternoon, I will again issue the call to action I offered this morning, which is to say, uh, you know, be brave, be candid, don't worry that it's not a, a, a good enough intervention. I think we need to come into this conversation with really open minds, with gratitude for the work the subcommittee has done, and at the same time recognizing we have just about a month to ensure this is as high impact as it can be. And then I will make it my personal responsibility with my colleagues in the Resilience Environment and Food Security Bureau, which we're just standing up, to ensure that we do all we can to implement uh, the recommendations that you're making. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gillian, both for your reflections today and for your vision and leadership of this important work for the climate strategy, from the climate strategy's inception. Uh, just before we go to the co-chair for the Climate Change Subcommittee, I would like to take a moment of liberty for the chairman to uh, call forward, call back, uh, uh, Rob Bertram, uh, Chief Scientist for the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security for USAID for a couple of very uh, important points that he'd like to make here today. Let's welcome Rob back. Thank you, Lawrence. I appreciate this. And I think we all had a terrific morning. I just, I think it was so stimulating and I'm looking forward to this afternoon and digging into the work of the subcommittee. Um, Lawrence, I, I wanted to pick up on a couple of themes from this morning, uh, just to welcome them and add a bit more that might be good context for this afternoon. Um, so we talked a lot about water and irrigation uh, Sarah Brownman made great points on that. And um, what we did in Feed the Future, and we can't take credit for what's happening, but we're proud of it, was we did a small-scale irrigation innovation lab for over 10 years that did exactly what we talked about this morning. It looked at gender in terms of access to irrigation. It looked at finance, policy, governance, tariffs on pumps, things like that. And also, it looked at environmental sustainability of groundwater, the modeling and such. So we really tried to integrate it. It was the International Water Management in Institute, uh, 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 Texas A&M, IFPRI, the Food Policy Research Institute, and uh, I think Delaware State. And, and so we're very proud of that. But I just heard from Tom Reardon, named some of you know, a professor at Michigan State, that his new data shows that in the last, and Jess, you're going to love this, in the last 10 years, 200,000 farm families in Zambia have moved into commercial vegetable production. And that is for Zambian cities and towns and rural areas. Maybe some of it's traded across the border, but it's being consumed, and it's driving down poverty, and it's being potentiated by farmer-led investment in small-scale irrigation. Now, Zambia is lucky. There's a lot of water in a lot of Zambia, so they're able to do that sustainably. But these are private goods, and, but they're, they, it's causing probably what was incremental at first, but is now transformative. And there's 400,000 more families that have actually started growing vegetables. They're just not fully commercial yet. So this is great news for nutrition, for African food systems, and probably climate resilience, too, in terms of uh, 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 rainfall, because horticulture, are, so many of these nutritious foods are so water dependent. There's, the water content is so high. Um, and it's not just about vegetables, right? It's about poultry, fish, uh, things that women can do often. Uh, so that's very exciting. And Tom's got, he's got evidence about increased consumption of vegetables in Tanzania, also very exciting. So this is being driven by growing incomes in cities and towns, but it's lifting all boats. Uh, including in the areas where poverty and malnutrition are most concentrated. Then also, just to pick up on Dr. Fowler's mention of the vision for adapted crops and soils, we are full partners in that. Um, I, just so people know, uh, in, Secretary Blinken announced $100 million on August 4th. $90 million of that is being implemented through Feed the Future and USAID. So we, we are hand in hand with the State Department and with the other partners that were mentioned. And a lot of that is for soil health, 
Some of it is also for the crop agenda, and perhaps during sometime this week we'll talk more about that. And Administrator Power, by the way, is very, very committed to the soil health agenda. But I wanted to come back to the water issue there because Sarah also mentioned the importance of rain-fed systems. 95% of the food in sub-Saharan Africa comes from rain-fed agriculture. So it's not necessarily going to be about irrigation, but it is about water management, rainfall management on farm, and, and, and we're working closely with the Stockholm International Water Institute around this agenda, and we think it's absolutely integral to really optimizing the soil health investments. Somebody talked about the fact that water in the soil, you get much more biology going. You get carbon fix, uh, being uh, conserved and sequestered. So I just wanted to also say that the, the, the water is absolutely essential um, for our food security goals, but also for our climate goals. And we're thinking about it where it can be irrigation, especially farmer-led, smaller scale. Somebody, I think, talked about the infrastructure challenges with the larger approaches. Great, but there's a huge number of African farm families who need to do better with water management. And, and we've seen it happen. We've seen huge increases through integration of legumes, through integration of perennials, better tillage methods that keep the water from running off and going into the soil, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we're very excited about that challenge, but I just wanted to flag that, that, that uh, you know, we're, we are very keen to walk forward with you on this. So thank you all very much. And thank you, Rob. Very, very important and interesting uh, <clears throat> points uh, that you raise here today. And thank you for bringing them to our attention. Now I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Aaron Coughlin de Perez, uh, co-chair of the Climate Change Subcommittee, who is joining us online from the Friedman School of Nutrition at Tufts University. Aaron will introduce the subcommittee members leading this important work. Aaron, if you're online, I want you to hear the applause from this room welcoming you. It's a pleasure to join you virtually today, and I'm sad not to be able to join everyone there in person because it sounds like a fantastic dialogue. So on behalf of the BIFAD Subcommittee on Systemic Solutions for Climate Change Adaptation and Mitigation in Agriculture, Nutrition, and Food Systems, I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We're eager to share with you this draft report, which contains targets and recommendations, and to have a rich conversation with all of you today. Today, you're joined in person by six of my fellow subcommittee members. I co-chair Vinny Wallenberg of the University of Vermont, the Alliance of Biodiversity International, and the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, Jessica Fanzo of Columbia University, Mario Herrero of Cornell University, Andrew Mohammed of the University of Tennessee, Caroline Nguyen of the Climate Action Platform for Africa, and Ishmael Sunga of the Southern African Confederation of Agricultural Unions. The other current members of the subcommittee not with you in person today are Daniela Shiriak of the Climate Policy Initiative, Chinenye Juliette Ejezia of the Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network, Sophia Hoyer of Accelerating Impacts of CGIAR Climate Research for Africa, and Peter Wright of CARE USA. The subcommittee was established in June 2022, you can believe it, in response to a USAID request for advice on addressing the climate crisis in agricultural nutrition and food systems. And of course, this is even more timely today. Uh, we saw last Friday the report from the global stock take of the UNFCCC was re released, and it essentially said that global emissions are not in line with what we are proposing to achieve as a global community under the Paris Agreement. And there is a rapidly narrowing window to raise our ambition. And as Gillian mentioned, this requires systems transformation. This report was very clear that that means all sectors and all contexts. We've, of course, seen increasing ambition for adaptation, but most observed adaptation efforts are also fragmented, incremental, sector-specific, and unequally distributed across the world. So in light of this context and the urgency 
that we're seeing in climate change mitigation and adaptation globally, we have this report to discuss with you today. It's been a year in the making, and the current draft has benefited from extensive peer review from peer reviewers and also lots of consultation with USAID. We began with a technical analysis of adaptation and mitigation in agri-food systems, selecting leverage points, and the author team then spent a lot of time consulting USAID to understand the opportunities for change within the agency to enable these transformations. My colleague, Lini Wallenberg, will delve into the report's objectives and findings in greater depth now, um, but I want to say that we're looking for your feedback and excited to hear your comments today, both in person and, and uh, virtually right now, but there is also a public comment form online. This is going to be open through next Monday, so please ruminate on these discussions, take a look at the text, and do send us your comments. We really are looking forward to hearing your ideas and feedback, particularly on the so what for USAID and how we can strengthen the report in its so what argument to the agency. The final report will be published in early October. So I'd now like to invite to the stage my fellow subcommittee members who will present an overview of the report, beginning with my co-chair, Lini Wollenberg. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, and good afternoon to everybody. Again, my name is Lini Wallenberg. I'm very pleased to, recommend to accompany my subcommittee members uh, to the podium here. So this is the part where we kick off sharing the results of the report, and we're going to um, do that very succinctly. I want to emphasize that uh, it's not really a report that the subcommittee wrote in, in, by any stretch of the imagination. There was a huge team uh, with the author, one of the authors, Ed Carr, sitting here, and with a huge amount of Tetra Tech support. And so uh, just to say that while we are making the recommendations formally to the BIFAD um, committee, it is, it is a report that has been commissioned, and we are just a committee that has helped to guide it and um, now report on it. So um, may I have the next slide, please? My job is to share with you uh, the targets, or sorry, the objective and the methods and then uh, the target recommendations. So the key objective of the overall report was to make recommendations that would advance adaptation mitigation in agriculture, food security, nutrition. Very simple. The methods that the author team used to produce this was, uh, were a literature review, review of USAID documents, uh, the subcommittee expert interview, uh, input uh, interviews with 66 key informants, including missions, including key informants um, outside of USAID, and then finally um, public sessions such as this over the course of the last two years. Next slide, please. The overall report is structured to represent three areas that we see as leveraging change um, for the agency. So the first is setting targets. Uh, the second is identifying the content, so that's the, like what we want to achieve. And then there's the content, the what, which is the high impact leverage points. And then finally, we have uh, recommendations related to USAID's own organizational change. That's the how. Next slide, please. So what are the targets? Uh, Gillian already gave them away, so it's no surprise. Um, but just to reiterate them, because it, does, it doesn't hurt to uh, repeat things. Uh, so we have a uh, adaptation, and all of these, I should say, are linked to the climate strategy of USAID. So the first is focused on adaptation, and it is a proportion of the climate change strategy um, target. So uh, 180 million people who are more resilient um, by 2030. And the idea is that, um, uh, uh, let's see, at least 50% of these should be women. Um, the target also requires that, or suggests that USAID look at a more outcome-based indicator, or most, more outcome-based target here, because this is just mentioning people, it's not describing what happens to those people. So can we have a better target in the future that actually describes what condition these people are in in order to be resilient? something related to livelihoods, for example. Uh, the second target uh, looks at um, mitigation. It's 1.2 gigatons or 1.2 billion tons of CO2 equivalents um, by 2030, uh, reduced from agriculture, and then a net zero uh, reduction in land use change associated with grasslands, peatlands, um, and other high carbon landscapes like forests. 
And then the third target is related to finance. Uh, it is $36 billion um, dollars, uh, in finance mobilized, including one third of that to be allocated to um, either gender or other social inclusion purposes. Over to Jess. Okay, great. Um, so we can go to the next slide. <laughs> So we're looking at several uh, recommendations that involve a lot of institutional change at USAID that we've been talking about all morning. Um, there's a list of five things and we'll, we'll work through those. I'll talk first about the strategy design and implementation and the program cycle and measurement and reporting and then we'll have our other colleagues from the subcommittee present research, uh, resource allocation and human resources. Go to the next slide. So the first recommendation is on strategy design and implementation in, in the program cycle. The agency should require the use of all climate-related data. So that could be data of now forecasting, sub-seasonal, seasonal, all the way to climate change data looking at decadal and longer-term projections, including all of that in the full program cycle. That could be in the strategy design and embedding all of that data into how agri-food systems are impacted by climate change and identify pathways that start to reach those targets. Project and activity design, looking at uh, climate adaptation and mitigation interventions within agri-food system programs. And then the monitoring and evaluation piece, incorporating climate indicators, again, this range of climate data, whether it's climate risk data, climate variability projections and impact data, across monitoring, evaluation, and learning plans, and adapting throughout the, the whole course of programs and strategies to pivot if needed. So that's recommendation one. And the second really is about measurement. And those of us who are researchers love this recommendation because we really want USAID to be able to measure and report on its impact, how its projects and programs are going to ensure that it can reach its climate strategy targets. And so there's a whole range of ideas here um, for doing that, where missions and bureaus set their defined contributions to the climate strategy, adaptation, mitigation, and finance targets, standardize, standardize those indicators and track their progress in, progress in a very transparent way through some sort of a data system or platform or mechanism, and then create accountability incentives to ensure compliance. And I just want to emphasize of these two recommendations in, in better uh, strategy design and implementation as well as measurement and reporting, this isn't just for climate projects. It should be across the entirety of all projects that touch on agri-food systems. And I think we can even say this even more boldly that a lot of these targets should be integrated across all of USAID because we're in, climate change is now everything change. Everything is changing. We absolutely have to incorporate climate in everything that we do. Okay, I'll turn it over to Andrew. Um, thank you. And so what I'd like to do is, <coughs> excuse me, just to say a few words about the um, next three recommendations, but I'll highlight research more so than the other two, and partly because of what we discussed this morning and just thinking about some of the feedback that we got. And the first thing I'll kind of highlight is something that you mentioned, Anthony, and that's um, sort of thinking about how do we incentivize actors to act. Right. And how do we incentivize producers to adopt certain practices? And so one of the things that's really key in this research agenda is um, thinking about ways in which we incentivize behavior and to study that and to understand that to help to inform implementation. But the other thing that we did not sort of include, but we should include, as was highlighted earlier by uh, 
think it was David Shirley, this morning in this whole idea of institutions involved in this implementation and governance process. And so when we think about this particular recommendation area, it's key that one of the things we really do need to do is to study more and to better understand quite a few things. And so one, it's the implications of sort of co-benefits and behavior and practices, as well as when you have trade-offs. And one of the things we did not highlight is what's highlighted in the report, is sort of how do we face short-term trade-offs and how do we get producers to implement practices where there are obvious short-term trade-offs that could in some ways sort of affect the economics of production systems. But clearly all of this is about sort of implementing th these practices in a food systems framework and really taking a long-term view. And so moving on to the next recommendations. Um, so this is pretty straightforward and this is mainly about this idea that clearly we need to allocate resources where the priorities are. Right, and so it's good to have this report and to highlight all the things that we'd like to do, but without resources to implement all of these recommendations, it's pretty much just sort of a document with recommendations. So clearly in it is this need to allocate resources and, uh, and, and as uh, Dr. Shavonda Jacobs sort of talked about at lunch, this idea that if you really want to get a return and see action, you have to sort of put finances behind it. And so lastly, if we could go to the next recommendation, which really follows up on the last, and that is we need people and human resources dedicated to these activities. And without human resources, none of this can possibly get done. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Ishmael. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, I'll talk to what has been identified as um, leveraging points, and there are, uh, there are eight of them. I'll speak uh, to the first four, which are uh, empowering youth, uh, women, and, un and other underrepresented groups. The second one being local research and innovation systems. The third being inclusive climate finance and the last one being integrated soil and water management. I'll start with the first. I think the first is very critical, which is talking really about um, the majority of uh, the populations that we are targeting. Uh, a large number of uh, them reside in rural areas and primarily they comprise of the youth and women. And uh, if we don't address them squarely and fairly, then we are not going to achieve the scale that we are looking at. And this is a non-technical issue which is nevertheless so fundamental in ensuring that the technical aspects that we are all trying to achieve are going to find a good home. So it's important that we really look at it as a precondition for the uptake of other, uh, other interventions, including other leveraging points. Um, one key issue really is um, to ensure that there's um, sufficient agency um, in, in those that um, don't have the voice to speak on behalf of themselves. Quite often, uh, research designs for them, and uh, then we need really to make sure that um, all the efforts that we make um, are focusing on those that uh, don't, don't have the resources, don't have the capacity to talk and to implement, and don't have the finances to actually put um, uh, the action uh, that is required uh, for them to change. So it's important that we have really looking at uh, access to resources in equitable fashion, and they're also looking at um, embedding their own local knowledge, local understanding, uh, so that uh, whatever interventions are, are speaking to their circumstances. The second point really is about um, local research and innovation systems. It has already been covered in earlier discussions, just to underscore the importance of co-creation, um, right from agenda setting in terms of research at the local level, as well as um, making sure that uh, in the entire research value chain, including the monitoring and evaluation of the impact thereof, is also taken into consideration. We can't overemphasize uh, this point. The third is about inclusive uh, finance, which is, uh, I call it, uh, the always elusive um, issue. We don't have enough finance, and we need finance from as many sources as possible and as many types as possible, because it's never going to be enough if we have to drive action 
um, at, at, uh, at the ground level. It talks to uh, the need for public-private uh, partnerships in terms of financing. It talks to capacities of uh, national institutions, including farmers organizations, to be able to prepare uh, projects that are bankable. And it also speaks to a, a number of uh, uh, facilities, particularly for the underprivileged. It could be for the youth. The final point, need I say more, because it has been discussed quite a lot about um, integrated soil and water management, that the two go hand in hand. They are complementary, but we also need to ensure that we are going to provide for um, the voices of those that have the local knowledge to come to bear with our own technical expertise so that we have a good mixture of both external and internal input. Uh, I finish here and I turn over to my colleague to handle the last four. Thank you. Thanks, Ismail. Um, so I'll present the, the last four recommendations. Uh, the first one, uh, well, the, the fifth one in the report is the integrated forest and agriculture and land management. This is a very important because this, this is where a lot of the heavy lift for mitigation for that 1.2 gigatons that you saw is likely to come up with. Uh, this requires obviously a, a lot of reduction in land conversion or trying to halt it as much as we can implementing sustainable intensification practices that have the potential to require less land to achieve the same productivity results. Uh, but obviously this requires a, a strengthened land, land use governance. I think that this is a critical governance point that we, we need to always emphasize. Uh, it also calls for improved information on land use change and the effect of agriculture supply chains on, on land use. and, and additional technical measures such as planting trees and so on. The next one, food loss and waste reduction, is, is also extremely important. In, in places where the majority of food is marketed through informal systems, food loss and waste can be very high. And it is really important that we make inroads in improving, uh, well, in, in, in reducing food loss, food loss and waste. Obviously, from a climate change perspective, we now need to take a much more emphasis on, you know, on increasing temperatures, on spoilage of products, etc. Uh, and in, in some really perishable products like ani animal source foods, uh, thinking of how to incorporate cold chains and a range of other things, or, or new processing ways uh, for the products to, to remove those uh, to remove food loss and waste. Uh, we need to invest a lot in its stakeholder capacity to implement some of, some of the technical solutions. And there is a big call here for investing in, in circular practices, which uh, can be quite available at, at the farm level and that could, could really be implemented at low cost. Uh, low emissions animal production uh, will be also key to the portfolio here and here we're really talking about improving livestock production efficiency. Here it's about productivity increases while in some cases we will also need to reduce uh, animal numbers. We need to really uh, bring methane to the conversation very explicitly, uh, not as a co-benefit but as a target for reduction and also clarify this in relation to what countries have agreed in the, in, in the national plans, which in many cases it's significant. In the countries where uh, you know, there's a lot of forest and, and cattle are the forest agriculture interface, we need to prevent cattle-driven deforestation. Then there's weather and climate services. We need to invest in public uh, and private climate services that, that prioritize really user needs, that really become useful for, for managing planting dates, uh, etc. Uh, we need to equip agricultural stakeholders and end users to act on the basis of climate services and improve agricultural productivity and resilience through the use of time-sensitive information. Thank you. I want to thank the subcommittee members for providing such a clear and digestible overview 
of this very content-rich report. Uh, you covered a lot of ground here, and I'm looking forward to the public conversation a bit later in today's meeting. Audience members, if you have questions on what you've heard, just heard, or the implications of the subcommittee's preliminary recommendations, please make a note of them now. Uh, we'll have a question and answer session after the next panel conversation. And now, Lini, Jess, Andrew, Ishmael, and Mario, thank you very much. You can take your seats at the subcommittee table. And now at this time, we'll hear reactions to the report from an expert panel of USAID staff and partners, and we'll discuss the, implementa the implica implications of the subcommittee's preliminary recommendations. Moderating that panel will be Carlin Nowen, a subcommittee member and co-founder of Climate Action Platform for Africa. So joining us online is Carlin Nowen. Oh, she appeared just like that. And here's Carlin. <laughs> Thank you very much. So this morning and just now, we heard about how integrated this must be, how systemic it is, how transformative it needs to be. And we even heard that more things need to be integrated into it, because there's maybe not enough attention to diets, there's maybe not enough integrated attention to water. We've also heard that it's incredibly contextual. And we've understood that hundreds of millions of rural households need to be impacted, need to be involved, need to be incentivized to do things differently. Most of USAID staff and their partners, I'm going to make a wild guess, are not twirling their thumbs. They're very, very busy people. Unlike many of my subcommittee members, I don't work in academia. So I think it's only fitting that I was asked to lead a panel that's going to discuss how the heck are we going to make this real? What does it take from these great insights and the wonderful discussions we've had to actually change the reality for the people whose life we want to make better, whose resilience we want to strengthen, and create a world that has a fairer and equitable prosperity for all? So I've asked the panelists that I'm about to call onto stage to be frank. They each get two to three minutes of opening remarks, which are completely unscripted by me. And then we'll go into a discussion about what is needed to maybe add it or changed to the report, or what else is needed for USAID and their partners for this to really be useful in a different way for them. So could I please be joined on stage by Jonathan Cook, Mofet Ngugi, Anthony Chapoto, and Sarah Gamage. Jonathan, would you mind starting with your opening remarks? Can you hear me? Okay, is this okay? Okay, well thanks so much. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I want to just start by acknowledging all of the hard work done by the sub subcommittee and the report team. I've been with you for a lot, long part of this journey and I can safely say you've all worked really, really hard to, to, to address a very complicated set of issues. So um, my congratulations. I think the report's really come a long way. Um, and I think specifically what I really like um, and kind of this gets to Carlin's point for this panel is the, uh, you know, the, the original draft of the report, some of you may remember, was very focused on these leverage points, right? Where are these areas for investment, attention, and opportunity? But what's really new and I think really critically important is all of the operational recommendations. How do we actually make this happen in the context of an institution many of us work at or are familiar with that's very complex and hard to change sometimes? So I think that, that balance between the programmatic and the operational is really welcome. Um, I want to just um, maybe mention three areas that uh, I see uh, as 
opportunities to further strengthen and, and expand the ambition of what's being recommended um, to us. Um, and these are not particularly new now that we've heard the morning. Um, I, I think uh, it's a good thing maybe that they've come up before because they reminded me that I was probably on track. But, uh, but I think you know, thinking about them again as a pivot to how do we make them happen is maybe a, a useful reminder. So number one is the climate urgency. I, I sit in the adaptation team uh, at USA and I see this every day. Um, as one of our colleagues said this morning, things are getting really bad, really fast. In fact, faster than we ever expected in many cases. Um, and so we're doing a lot at the agency. There's no doubt that the ag and food work has come a long way in taking on board climate over the last number of years. But I think it's fair to say we still haven't done enough, hence the need for this report and for the conversation we're having. Um, and I think one of the absolutely critical points to me is how do we think in a longer term way about the changes that are coming, that are already coming, and the pathways we need to be on to get to, to them. How do we set up our programming, our research agenda, to be focused on literally the future, right? We're feeding the future and we have to take stock of what that future is increasingly going to look like. And that means, in my mind, how do we incrementally, but also transformationally work? In other words, how do we continue all of the great work we're doing to improve um, breeding and seeds and soils and water, while also looking at what the climate information is telling us about where agriculture will happen what will be possible, what suitabilities and viabilities will be changing. How can we build that longer term perspective into all the work that we're doing in the present? Number two is integration. So um, again, this came up a lot this morning. Um, how do we remain cognizant of the requirements and the constraints that funding at USAID sometimes places us under and yet still work to find ways to integrate our programming to achieve, I think as, as Lini put it, multiple North Stars. How do we recognize the multifunctional and multi-objective needs within our work and, and break down those silos? And I, you know, I've been there for 10 years and like many of my colleagues, I know how hard this can be, but we also have examples of doing it. We just haven't, I think it's fair to say, mainstreamed them yet. We have, we have too many of these great examples on the margins. We haven't yet made those multifunctional, integrated ways of, of doing ag, environment, and climate programming, and water, I should say, uh, stick. And so I think finding ways to embed uh, agriculture within the larger landscape to break down those, those artificial boundaries between the production units, the farm, the fields, and all of those places around them, the watersheds, the cities, um, and the natural resources on which agriculture depends. Again, we all get this conceptually. How do we operationalize it in our programming? Um, and I love, the, I love that Rob brought up tree crops this morning. I mean, that's just such an area for, for potential ways to show how to do that. Um, and then number three is kind of the mainstreaming piece of this, right? So as Gillian alluded to, um, Budgets are still remarkably slim on climate and we don't control them, Congress does. And so I can't sit here and say we're gonna get a lot more money to work directly on climate, but you know what? Our climate strategy allows us to do a lot without that budget because of its focus on mainstreaming. Um, there's an incredible transformation that has happened within the agency since I've been there in terms of really putting that onus on all of our program areas, all of our sectors, to be part of the solution, to view this as part of their jobs. And I think what we really need to look hard at is how many of our non-climate funded programs are really delivering in that regard. And what more can we be doing to get those climate related results from our quote unquote non-climate programs, at least the ones that don't receive direct climate funding. Um, so I think um, I'll probably just stop there. I want to, again, just thank um, the team, the subcommittee, and all of the, the hard work that's gone into this report, and I'm looking forward to the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan.
Now, the audience can't see that, but I'm looking at a clock here that's ticking remarkably fast. So it, in order to make sure that we actually have some time for discussion and questions as well, I hope that the panelists can stick to the two to three minutes. Mofat, you're next. All right, you just asked a long-winded guy to go fast, but anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, Mofat here. My, my reaction is that um, I think I'll, I'll channel Rebecca Shaw. I, th I thought that um, the report was comprehensive and raises uh, really useful uh, considerations for USAID um, staff, both and, and, and partners, uh, for during the implementation of food security programs. Uh, it could have been a very academic sort of uh, treatise, uh, understanding the, 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 the subcommittee. But really, I, I think for a policy audience, policymaker audience, they really did a good job of um, how they structured it and how they kind of broke it down uh, with, the re uh, with the recommendations. Um, for me, the, 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 the term operational kind of comes in quite strongly. Uh, and I think teams that are, are going to be working on um, design and, and, and planning projects can really implement. They can look at this. Uh, recommendations and actually do something and it can influence the decisions that are going to be made. Now, it also sets a good context um, uh, for the, um, the challenges and then frames recommendations uh, based on a our agency climate strategy, uh, including uh, leveraging points. Um, the call to action is bold, um, acknowledging current past work, while also urging for more. Uh, suddenly, we need funding, uh, as, as uh, uh, Jonathan sort of alluded, uh, as we uh, an intentionality going into the future. And then prominent references uh, to valorizing uh, localization, indigenous knowledge, cultural context, uh, and, and sort of really merging traditional and modern science is, is a really strong point that st stood out for me. And, and, and I think it's a, looking at the agency's localization efforts, it's a huge opportunity for us to actually think that and, and, and find ways to implement um, climate resilience with that in mind. So this is, will, will suddenly likely enhance adoption and, 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 um, of adaptation and mitigation innovations. I think uh, Chipotle also mentioned this this morning. Uh, now, some room for improvement in my view. Um, on recommendation number one, um, I appreciated the emphasis on uh, climate data uh, in the program cycle, and I think as, as, as laid out. Now, I do think that we need to have really serious um, investment or uh, capacity expansion, both within USAID staff, but also maybe with uh, additional uh, partner support, really to get expertise getting into those design teams that can understand uh, climate data and um, sort of some of the scenarios playing out. Because currently, I, ca I can assure you that there are many people who kind of think, um, how, is the, how is this climate uh, linked to my program? So I think suddenly for food security and agriculture, it's, it's quite close. But I know that when we think about the broader, uh, beyond food security and agriculture, there are going to be a lot of questions. Uh, so that capacity needs to be paired, I think, with uh, recommendation number five, which, which actually talks about the human resources angle. So to me, I think that's uh, very important for recommendation one to also reflect what the implication for human resource and capacity within USAID staff and suddenly within partners as well. Uh, for recommendation three and four, uh, absolutely resonates um, on, on temporary ex uh, extension beyond uh, the short term. I think. We saw that um, there's that idea that we cannot be thinking in, in two-year cycles, five-year cycles. The strategy itself, the USAID climate strategy, does go an, uh, sort of on an eight-year cycle, which is uh, unusual. Usually, our strategies are five years. So that's already good. But I would also sort of emphasize uh, and call for a need for spatial, a spatial lens as well, so that we are not only thinking about that farm scale the intensification of agronomic practice on a particular farm or a particular uh, uh, sort of ranch area, and rather to also think about the basin level and uh, system level, landscape level type uh, consideration for, for both mitigation and adaptation. Um, 
So USAID has lots of uh, complementary innovation labs that do important uh, crop research as well as genomic resources and you know, soil and water research. And I feel like uh, additional emphasis of the like of uh, the Sustainable Intoxication Lab and part of what we saw historically with the Sustainable Agriculture and Natural Resources Management uh, Innovation Lab, that kind of research that really kind of looks at uh, landscapes uh, is, is quite needed uh, going forward. And then under recommendation six on high potential average point, I think the, the, the mention on preventing cattle-driven deforestation I, I feel kind of needs to also be uh, specified. I think uh, Mario already mentioned it a little bit. We kind of need to be specific about the kinds of landscape where that is necessary and needed. Whereas we do need improvements in livestock management, for instance, in the dry tropics, we absolutely must emphasize, and we cannot seem to be discouraging uh, investment in livestock production in, in a lot of these dry land systems because it's essential for food security, nutrition, income, welfare, even cultural aspects. So that's a very important uh, uh, additional uh, clarification. I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mofa. Can we? Yes. <laughs> that won't get us into trouble with the clock, that bit of applause. Anthony, we heard Mofat talk about the need for intentionally valorizing local insights, knowledge, and local capacity enhancement. I'm guessing you have a thing or two to say about that, but um, don't want to direct you too much, please. No, th thank you very much. I mean, it's a, it was a privilege to be a peer reviewer for this report. I think I had to read the report maybe three times. First time was tough because it had to do with USID things and all that. But when I went into the recommendations, the leverage points, I got excited um, because uh, there are things that are mentioned in this report that are very key and core. That's one long term perspective. It's very key. You can't have a short term perspective about uh, really. Uh, uh, dealing with climate change issues. So that long-term horizon is very important. Local uh, knowledge, very key. But I mean, as Dev indicated in the first session, that I think we have to think about local institutions for sustainability. The other point I think maybe that I have to mention is that, uh, you see, USID has comparative advantage, but we are in a space where there are others. So. Can this comparative advantage be utilized to harness uh, investments that are required to really have long-term changes? Because if you look at, say, these rural communities, if we talk about climate services, you need, if it is digital climate services, for example, what you need is uh, communication means for people to be able to receive this. That means you need investments in communication towers. If you talk about markets to work, for example, you need feed the roads, you need the roads. But if, say, uh, USAID investments don't go that far, that means you need, to level, you need to use your power to say, you come and invest in A, B, C, D, so that our investments that we are making can have a long lasting effect. So use that power to be able to attract additional investments that will really transform. It, it has to, I mean, for it to be transformative, you need that. That's it. Then the last point, maybe, because I can see it's maybe I have some few seconds. The last point is uh, uh, using uh, USAID resources to catalyze uh, sustainability in the, in, 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 in the different geographies. It's because this document, I, I take it that it's not a panacea for every country. What it is, is local missions now have to take the document and try to domesticate it. So issue of stakeholder engagement in designing programs, policies, regulations, investments, I think they have to be done at a local, local, level, local level. So I'm very excited that, uh, that uh, we we are moving in the right, right direction. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thanks, Anthony. And I love how you bring that outside perspective in and the challenge and make us reflect upon what does USAID specifically have that it can leverage and how can it bring others in. Sarah, I'd love to hear your opening statement. Thanks. Um, well, I just want to say it was a fantastic report to read and that I also spent about <laughs> most of my weekend rereading it several times because it's incredibly content rich and very, um, very thoughtful. So I just sort of want to call out some of the things that I'd like to celebrate in it. Um, I found particularly helpful when I think about the programming of the work that we're doing, particularly in Latin America, but across the Nature Conservancy, the geographic prioritization of adaptation and mitigation efforts and their integration. That was very helpful. I would say, however, we must be super vigilant. This taxonomy is going to be dynamic and it's going to shift rapidly over time. So let's revisit it often, particularly in some of the regions which we know are very vulnerable to climate change. It also made me think a lot about the importance of layering our strategies and layering our mitigation and adaptation and financing and having a very differentiated approach for smallholders. But we spend a lot of time in my small unit in TNC thinking about value chains and value chains with high levels of monopsony in them and high transition costs and transaction costs for transitioning. So I think, you know, we need to, it, none of this is independent of the political economy of the production, and I'd like to see a little bit more of that brought out in the analysis. Um, the layering of the strategies is going to be really important for crops that have highly correlated shocks, and I think it's also going to be really important at a landscape level. So I would really sort of appeal to a deeper sort of thinking about that as you operationalize it. Um, Delighted to see lots of great recommendations about data collection. Can we also appeal for more data sharing and making it much more public and much more available so that it can inform our implementation strategies as well, but also other donor strategies and the coordination of other donors? This also means you're going to have to invest time in building capacity across the missions and agencies, but also with implementers, so that we've got some really kind of consonant and convergent statistics that are meaningful. And please also emphasize both qualitative and quantitative methods. Mixed methods are going to be really important as we're thinking about behavioral change and understanding and sort of farmer-centered approaches where you really do understand who is farming and how they're farming. So that would be great. Um, there were some concerns I had. There was um, policies seemed to be a little sublimated throughout the document, and I'd like to see more emphasis on policy, engagement with host country governments, NDCs and NAPs, you know, harmonizing with that. I think that's going to be critical. I was also surprised at a notable absence of any analysis of social protection platforms and green social protection. You know, I think you could really invest there and some of the research could be driven towards how social protection also de-risks and how it can beget greener and how it can reinforce more kind of regenerative practices and going beyond payment for ecosystem services. And then finally, I was missing a really more thoughtful discussion on reversal of harmful subsidies, both in terms of removing some critical distortions but also in terms of generating fiscal space. I think this is going to be critical. You know, the World Bank has highlighted the extent to which harmful subsidies are massively distorting and increasing pressure on forests and, you know, precipitating massive biodiversity loss. How is it that we're not also looking at the reversal of harmful subsidies as a big piece of our strategy to address the fiscal space for much more integrated programming around climate change and agriculture. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Sarah. You can hold on to that mic, because I'm going to come to you first. Um, as we were prepping this, you told me, I am really attached to the second question I had prepared, which was everything that you were missing. Now, I'm guessing you peppered that into your opening remarks, because you also were looking at that clock and going, I might get only one bite at this apple. But is there anything that you still wanted to share with us in answer to that second question on what you felt was missing or we needed to strengthen? 
Thank you. Um, yes, I think it's really critical that we also think about harmonizing efforts with different country governments and their SDG agendas, and that seemed to be very absent. Really reinforce the importance of national uh, research and extension systems and investments in those national research and extension systems. They are the front line, and that is where we will be able to sort of overcome political cycles if we can deeply invest in those cadres of folk who really are on the front line out there. Um, again, sort of resurfacing the importance of green social protection. I would draw attention to things like um, Bolsa Verde in uh, Brazil. I would draw attention to ABC in Brazil. Uh, you know, these are the kinds of programming that if we can look at this and analyze it and figure out how to do this better and reinforce the value that this type of uh, support has, how do, how do we build those systems so that they can withstand political cycles as well? I think that's going to be key. I was somewhat disappointed that there were only seven references to NDCs and five to the NAPs, so I think they could feature more prominently. Um, I also felt that we really do need to think about this question of fiscal space um, and understand the context in which we're operating and the sort of impoverishment of governments in contexts of high debt. So we might also be interested in looking at some of those debt conversion strategies and some of the more sort of macro parts of it. Um, I also feel that we just don't pay enough attention to the political economy along value chains and monopsony, but we're also focused often on highly traded products and not necessarily on home consumption. And I think particularly if you have a nutrition objective, then you really do need to be looking at home production and consumption. And this means having a highly gendered lens and also thinking about the opportunity cost of time and people's time budgets and time poverty. So I hope that in your women's economic empowerment programming, there's a really thoughtful approach there to care burdens and time poverty because you don't necessarily want to be focusing investments that are going to increase time burdens and time poverty. Thanks. Thank you so much. So Mofat, that's a lot of homework. It's a lot of homework coming from this report on what the missions need to do. There's a lot of asks from the local partners. And as I said in my opening remarks, you're not sitting idle twirling your thumbs. So what do you need, what do people at the mission need to make some of this happen? I believe the, the capacity is uh, basically understanding the, the tools for climate resilience, the training. I think from the previous investment and work that was done relating to climate risk management was a great initiative, I guess, uh, since about maybe five, six years back. And we need to reinvest still more uh, in really bringing the relevance of what it means to be climate resilient, both adaptation and mitigation kind of dimensions with the designer. So people certainly within the, the, the career core, obviously, uh, in agriculture, but certainly across backstops, really. Because historically, a lot of the work relating to mitigation and uh, adaptation was really kind of viewed as something with the environment office. Mm -hmm. And right now, it, it kind of needs to be that it's everybody's business, really, not even just the agriculture, uh, yeah? And I think the exercise carried out to, to do the uh, climate, uh, basically the incorporating the climate strategy within the CDC, our country cooperation strategy, um, development strategy, uh, mid cost correction type things. We need that to be really resonating with the uh, officials, that, that both the technical offices as well as the program offices and maybe even our folks who, who work with um, uh, the, the finance, for instance, the mission leaderships and so on. So to me, I feel like giving permission to say, yes, it's complicated, it needs, it needs a lot of uh, integrated uh, consideration for what the, the climate impact will be for particular programs. It's gonna take time, it's gonna take effort, and we, we must put in the work. And I feel that's signaling, as, as we've seen within the agency, uh, right from the top, uh, even throughout the whole administration, the attention to that is quite important. And I feel that the, 
the, the host countries oftentimes already know and realize the urgency. And therefore, uh, it's not a very heavy, you don't need to do a, a whole lot of convincing to say, Ministry of Agriculture, hey, look, you, you need to do adaptation, you need to do address issues with mitigation, uh, climate resilience, and so on. The, 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 that's a sort of a direct, easy, uh, maybe not very easy, but it's, they are much more amenable to paying attention, and it's really upon, I feel like, USAID as an, as an agency and with the various other partners, other donors, uh, other uh, investors, other uh, private sector, academia, to really uh, put the capacity into how we design and, and, and implement our activities. Thank you so much. Now, when you ask a Dutch person to facilitate a panel, you get at least two things. You get directness, which I think you got, you got and you get somebody who watches time, which I did. We ran out of time. My apologies to Jonathan and Anthony that we couldn't have follow-up questions, but I believe there's a segment now that gives the audience here and online a chance to ask questions and comment, and I don't want to encroach upon that. So back over to Ishmael. So sorry, I should have remembered that. That was in my run of show. <laughs> One round of applause for our panel again. Thank you so much. No, you're staying. You're staying, yeah. Can uh, am I on? You step and stay, yeah. Can you hear me? Ishmael, do you want my mic? Um, oh, I'm you have, the ooh, you've got the fancy thing. <laughs> okay. I, I think it's loud and clear, am I? <laughs> Thank, thanks, uh, Caroline, for, for that um, facilitation. Uh, I've been enjoying this conversation greatly since morning up to uh, this point, and I'm sure I'll enjoy it up to the end of the day. And I'm curious to hear what um, has resonated well with, um, with um, the audience, both online and physical. And uh, I want to turn first to the BIFAD um, members to share any questions and reactions. Uh, then we'll hear from the audience, including the online audience. Let me start with uh, the Chair, Lawrence. Um, any reflections, any questions that you might want to address? Okay, right. Nothing from. Um, yes, please. It's already on. I'm struck by how ambitious we all are, and of course, the magnitude of the problem. So, what we've heard a lot about is the need to layer strategies, the need to break down functions that normally function in silos, and then there are more and more suggestions coming up about what was missing and should be added. And the manager in me just starts thinking about all those flowcharts and how process heavy this is going to be when we are facing a crisis that is escalating much more rapidly, as you've said, than we ever anticipated. How does USAID maintain agility while implementing all these recommendations? I suppose it's a question that I could um, direct to any of you, maybe particularly those that are in the USID. The billion dollar question, no, no, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, I think, and actually this point about agility was something I didn't get a chance to, to bring up. Um, you know, I think we, we have a lot of cycles and we're always chasing the next cycle in terms of planning projects or evaluating projects. I think there's, there's got to be, and this is, this is above my pay grade probably, but there's got to be some ways we can um, start to think about how to, how to set aside resources, both financially and otherwise, to, to respond more rapidly to certain opportunities or needs. I think about this from the research context in terms of addressing urgent questions uh, more rapidly in some cases. And I also think about this programmatically. We do have, you know, a lot of flexibility is built into the program cycles to make changes in main course, to do, um, you know, sort of stock taking and to adaptively manage, right, which is really what it comes down to. So I think, you know, partially in response to your, your point, I think we have to look for more of those opportunities to pivot as needed and to respond more dynamically to opportunity. Um, that's part of the answer. Yeah, just really quick. For, from my perspective, I feel like we must borrow a leaf from 
humanitarian community. One thing from this uh, report, there was a couple of mentions of humanitarian work, but when there is a, right now there's a Morocco um, uh, earthquake that happened. Uh, USAID DART teams are like mobilizing and getting out there and doing work and delivering and saving lives and, and all that. So part of what we must think of it is that we have to have that urgency and, and coordinate more with our humanitarian assistance side. Uh, because I, I, I do agree, maybe from our USAID development side, there's a lot of process and, and, and uh, uh, sometimes a lot of, uh, uh, it just it takes a long time to make an award, to start implementing and so on. So we really could learn a lot from that side of the humanitarian assistance side. Thank you. Th th thank you. Um, yes, Doc. What do you suggest, if anything, can be done to make for 500 million small landholders carbon farming a commodity crop for the future? I, 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 I suggest I could also handle that question. Can I? Uh, that comment. I'm, I'm, um, I'm uh, an avid believer of a new generation of farmers. Uh, particularly the younger farmers, and uh, if really you can make money out of carbon farming, why not catalyze the whole movement of a new generation of farmers, provided the price is fair and the price is reasonable, uh, they will go into it because it's an entrepreneurial opportunity. So I, I think let's go for ambition. Ambition we can get it from the young that are aggressive, that are looking for opportunities. Quite often we are selling we are selling problems and not selling opportunities that climate change actually brings with it. Uh, only, and Can I, I add to that, Ishmael? Yes, May please I? go ahead. <laughs> so I fully agree with that. The devil is in the detail for many of these things. And one urgent request I would make for USAID and others is for that to really work and really work equitably, there's a need for fair and equitable market access. And it's hidden in your in your statement of the price needs to be fair. In the voluntary carbon market right now, if you're lucky, you get $10 a ton. There's no way that you can design and run a good program, a good intervention that gives profit to everybody involved with the right MRV, the right quality and integrity to for five to $10 a ton. And what happens is that the quality and the integrity suffer and the communities are the ones that get the least in terms of benefits. So there's a, there's a lot of further detail that I'd love to add that we don't have time, to, time for, but the one thing, support governments to get ready for trading in compliance markets, help them be Article 6 ready, and as you design your compliance markets, make sure that Africa has fair and equitable access, because otherwise there is no carbon revenue for communities. Any questions, on Andre, that you want to post? No. Any board members online who want to uh, post questions to the presenters. Ishma, if I can add something, I think uh, on carbon markets, basically, <laughs> I think there's a knowledge gap. Okay. And we need to close it. People don't understand what it is. So if we don't close the gap, then there is not going to be any equitable carbon market. So we need to close the gap at the national level, sub-national level, and uh, at the community level. Thank you. Thank you. It's a point about um, climate literacy. I call it climate literacy. There's a lot of assumptions that we all have here that we all know as rural people that uh, what is climate change in the way that we understand it and what are the opportunities that they are. We don't normally see as farmers climate change. We, we see things that we do and climate change might not be directly what we do. It's an outcome of some of our practices. So there's need also to invest in climate literacy including the opportunities that will come with it. I'm going back to any board members that are online, if they have any questions to address the panel. No. Okay, can I, can I take um, from, from the floor any questions, burning questions to um, our panelists? Yes, madam, at the back. Eh? Then um, we'll go number two and then number three at the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is Erin McGuire. I'm the director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Horticulture. I really appreciated this morning's comments, very much appreciated the panel, and of course the report is wonderful. 
I'm also a huge believer in these long-term research solutions and uh, systems-based approaches, the uh, localization bit, the uh, long-term partnerships. Uh, I have a qu and I really appreciate the monitoring and evaluation. But I have a question on the M&E and how we evaluate research long-term as we want to continue to invest in research. Often widgets and uh, units measurable doesn't necessarily align or incentivize uh, these longer term uh, systems-based solutions, whether it's research or institutional capacity building. So I'd love to hear your comments on how we incentivize and measure and make sure we're making progress on these goals. Please take note of uh, the question on uh, monitoring evaluation. Can I take two more questions before the panel can answer? Uh, the next one was uh, over here. And, and then the last one um, on the back right, before we come back to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting uh, conversations. I'm John Anderson. I'm between jobs. Uh, I have uh, three quick sort of observations and questions. One r relates to M Moffat's uh, observation about humanitarian assistance. Adaptation is not going to get us there. Mitigation is not going to get us there. There are a lot of people who are just flat out going to suffer. And we need to somehow build in the humanitarian part of this into, that, into the equation. The second comment is about the political economy. I don't think we're talking about that enough. Sarah, Sarah mentioned that. But there are two things about that. Markets through misopsonies and other uh, phenomenon, markets do not work for the poor. The more we push markets on the poor, the more poor they get because the markets aren't working for them. So yes, value chain, et cetera, et cetera, but we have to be very, very careful about how markets are working and whether they're actually working for the poor. The other side about, about political economy that I have not heard anything about is rights, right? It's fine to talk about trees and soil and, and moonshots, but who owns these things? Who has rights over these things? Who has rights to and access to information? Who has rights and access to uh, decision making? Who has rights and access to recourse? These kinds of things I think are, are essential. We're not going to be able to tech our way out of the climate crisis. Thank you. The last one. Um, take note of the issues that have been raised about, um, about rights, and political economy, and get ready to answer the questions. Yes, um, yeah. yes sir. Well, I, I had a question for Mario, and he had to run. <laughs> but I just want to uh, repeat it here. I'm Jeff Dahl, uh, Director of the Livestock Systems Innovation Lab at the University of Florida. And my question was with regard to livestock production, uh, when it's labeled in the report as low emissions livestock, uh, I think that that can have some implications versus low emissions intensity livestock production, which is, I think, more consistent with what Mario described. And that will have implications for actual nutrient availability and nutrition of folks when we talk about low emissions livestock versus low emissions intensity. Th th thank you. Um, let's take them one by one. There was the first question on M and V, monitoring eva and evaluation. Who is going to be taking care of that? Yes. Answer as an implementer who has struggled with MRV and just sort of thinking a little bit. Obviously, USAID and the State Department have some really great guidance on complex evaluations, and I just love to sort of wave that report again and remind us of complex evaluations because sort of, and I think it also goes to the agility point. We often get stuck with log frames and results chains that are pretty immovable. And how can we pivot when we suddenly have an exogenous event that just throws all of the sort of carefully tracked data off course? Um, and how can we also sort of solve that attribution gap when causality is incredibly complex difficult to identify and what we the best we can get to is just sort of co-movements in certain variables. So I just want to kind of wave a 
flag for that fantastic piece of work that was done on complex evaluations and sort of an appeal to slightly more circular and fluid uh, results chains and log frames because I think that will enable us to pivot a lot better but it will also enable us to capture some of those highly context specific details that are not necessarily reflected well in some of the indicators that we're managing. Thanks. Um, reg regarding the m &E question, my take is that yes, it's difficult to do long-term monitoring and long-term impact assessment. Um, BIFA had actually conducted an analysis uh, a couple of years back uh, about how much, how much uh, investment in research sort of yields. And I feel like a similar kind of a, a, an, an attention to what, for instance, in, in horticulture lab or any lab, some of that long-term um, impact needs to be uh, innovated in terms of uh, how we will measure it because we suddenly always kind of go by year by year. We have our indicators uh, and uh, there's been an attempt to align climate change and feed the future indicators. Uh, again, very quite focused on year by year, but the question is how do you then capture a long term and that's a question mark for me, but I think we need innovation on that for sure. Maybe we need an innovation lab on, on that. But um, the, the second question that uh, uh, John raised are relating to rights and tenure. I feel like that's a big question. It goes back to something Carol, uh, Caroline brought up in terms of, um, if for instance, on carbon, who owns and who has a right to get carbon payments, the whole question of benefit sharing and what kind of regimes different countries have. In Mozambique, we have a, a current activity we are trying to look at voluntary carbon markets, and it's a very salient question in terms of benefit sharing. So the framework around nature, wealth, and power kind of comes in strongly, especially as we think about how we will look at the historic recapitalization in, in, in the tropics uh, to, to combat climate change. So very, very important consideration for the policy level. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to say on the m and &E side of things. I think there's kind of two timescales that are important, really. I mean, we need the long-term data and evaluations for sure, but I think we also need sh shortcuts to understand how these quicker pivot actions uh, are working or not working so that we can do things quickly and maybe fail and move on sometimes. And I think particularly in the adaptation context, we can't afford to wait for the rigorous um, impact evaluations that we might like to invest in and probably do need to invest in as well. We've got to also have some uh, opportunities to look on those, those more urgent timeframes. Again, pivoting to this kind of linkage with the humanitarian side of things, right, where um, things are speeding up, uh, if anything. And then, I, I mean, I'm glad John brought up all of the critically important stuff that probably is underweighted in the report right now. I'd like to see more on political economy as well. Um, you know, we, we, um, we certainly, from the adaptation perspective, are making a big push right now on locally led uh, approaches and on equ equity, um, which is not the same thing, but opens up more of those conversations, much as the benefit sharing does on the mitigation side. And I think this is critically important. Um, and I just want to say one last point, um, because we're going to run out of time again, is um, just on the various other things people have put on the table. I think, again, a lot of this is happening within the agency, but it's not always connected. We have work on social protection. In fact, some of it's in my Center for Resilience within the, the Bureau. We're doing a lot of really good stuff with missions on social protection. Ag Extension, I know Jerry works a lot with, with the Ag Extension networks in many uh, of the countries we're active in. And on NAPS and NDCs, uh, Emily's here and the CASI program's doing a lot of really good work with countries on their NAPS and NDCs. I think the challenge is again uh, integrating and articulating the ways that these sort of disparate pieces of work, some of which sit in different parts of the agency and are funded in different ways, contribute to a shared set of objectives that we've been talking about here today. One yeah, minute. Uh, it's political economy issues. I think. Uh, I mean, we work in a space where there could be a million dollar reasons for not wanting to change because of special interest. And often you find that we try to change things that we can't change. Like, for example, I'll give you an example of subsidies, these fertilizer subsidies in, 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 in Southern Africa. 
they are going to be there. Whether we like it or not, we have tried to change them for years. So maybe what we need is a strategy where we start talking about how do we green the subsidies, refocus the attention to those things that are beneficial and making these subsidies much more effective. I think Sarah talked about the NDCs and NAPs. I think they, I can't think of anything that, uh, I mean, that USID does that does not fit into that. But if we work outside these frameworks, you'll find that our work is not contributing to the national legitimate contributions or the national adaptation plans, but definitely it does. So I think it is important that we, the silo aspect, that if it is nutrition work, environment work, it all fits into what the country is working on. So I think it's better to break these silos because whatever we are dealing with is multi-dimensional, multi-sectoral. So that means working in your own box doesn't benefit, benefit uh, 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 the country or help to remedy the problem. So I think it's important that we all put our effort in these national processes so that at least the resources we are putting can really make a difference. Thank you. Kalan, want to say something? Maybe on the political economy as well as perhaps on livestock. I don't know. You haven't said livestock yet. To that. Yeah, so I have very little to add, but I did want to acknowledge that the livestock question wasn't answered yet. I can say something about it, but I'm not an expert. So, Lini, could you answer that? Yeah. Um, ooh, where's Jeff? Thank you. Uh, so we explicitly did decide on low, low emissions rather than intensity because climate change, climate change needs to have a certain uh, reduction in emissions. And to just deal with emission intensity does address the food security problem, but, but it doesn't address emissions. So we know that we can change the kind of livestock. We can change all kinds of technical aspects from herd composition to feed additives to the genetics of the livestock. And so options actually exist. But to just deal with emission intensity would be kind of sidestepping the climate change mitigation question. And, uh, I guess I would counter that low emission livestock could be just a dramatic reduction in the amount of food that we eat. Yeah. 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 Yeah
is somebody going to go back and look at the indicators? Because we've got a wealth of information, but if you've ever implemented, if it's not an indicator that's in our proposal, even though we might have written of activity on it, we're not going to do that activity. We're going to answer to the indicators that we currently have and do activities around those. So it might be something you want to recommend. Thank you. Any reactions from the panel? Or just comments uh, to take into account when we are finalizing the report. Um, there was a question that came from uh, one of the board members. The question was, what are your hopes about what will follow on from the report? I suppose the question was also coming to me as um, one of the subcommittee members. My, my hopes are that um, really we are going to have one whole USID. Uh, what comes across to me as an outsider is that it is different elements working not necessarily in unison. But for this challenge to be confronted head on, it requires that everyone comes together purposefully and deliberately to come and into uh, one plus one equals four or five instead of equals two. That's what I think, uh, in my view, should really come out of this. We can still do much more with what we have if we coordinate, if we cooperate within, and also if we use our strength as USID to leverage and crowd in many other players to do those things that we as USID might not be able to do directly, but can influence others to do. That's my take on it. Any take on that from uh, what, subcommittee members? What is it um, you hope to get out of this um, moving forward? I guess the, the oh wow, the, the only thing for me that, um, not only, but, but something that I appreciated that the report highlighted, and that is this understanding of agriculture in a developing country context, and that we address climate issues while at the same time still thinking about issues of agricultural productivity, profitability, and well-being in developing countries, and not sort of take this um, sort of the approach that we have for, say, within the United States that there's a need to sacrifice, whereas the report, I think, really does think about co-benefits and win-win strategies. And, and I really do hope that USD, uh, USAID sort of goes down that road. Thank you. Um, we still have, uh, pardon, we have another two minutes to go. Can I? Oh. Uh, please, the question. Peter Wright, please. Um. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'm Peter Wright, I'm with CARE US, and I work in the climate resilient agriculture. I just wanted to point out uh, actually a lot of the questions that were raised about the weak points and the things that were not sufficiently emphasized in the report hinge on that first uh, uh, key leverage point that we, that we uh, brought into the report, that is in the report, uh, concerning the empowerment of, of women and, and youth. Uh, the reason being that a lot of the things that we think about uh, that are going to work, uh, when we think about them ourselves, we take them to the communities and find out the communities don't really have, they're not either engaged in what we think they should be doing, or they don't have the skills, or they don't have the uh, the buy-in to it to really say, yes, this is what you want to do. So there's a real critical element here in developing that, uh, in improving the capacities and the empowerment of these uh, women and youth. Uh, and when you get past that, and I'll just say that's sort of the incremental uh, development that we need to do. You need to develop these capacities in an incremental way. Uh, as, as Howard Buffett said, it's been on, online a couple of times, uh, you can't produce a baby in one month by impregnating nine women. Some things take time. Setting those, those uh, local communities up and empowering them does take some time. But once you have that, it starts to unravel a lot of these other complex questions. Uh, rights to resources. These women uh, go down to the, to the local community government and, and say, look, uh, we, need some, we need some land, we need some water, we need this, we need that. And because there are thousands of them doing this, it has weight. The same thing when the youth start getting involved in it. We've seen that starting to happen. These social uh, 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 support systems that somebody talked about, we see them setting those kinds of things up. 
we see them bringing local knowledge into it. We see them bringing management skills where there were none. Uh, somebody said, oh, you, you can't uh, uh, manage uh, equipment on a collective means because uh, it, it always goes downhill. It always goes downhill because they're mismanaged, not because you can't do it. So these uh, empowered groups really bring a lot to the equation when you get there. That's where you start getting your transformational change, including the rights issues. Uh, as John mentioned, you can start to address those at a very local level uh, where they need to be addressed because those policies are there. The rights are there. They're in the constitutions. They're just not implemented. And you won't get that implemented until you have empowered local communities uh, that are able to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much for those um, reflections. Um, I think um, if I can summarize what you are saying, it's a risk of uh, not doing the right job. I think it's instigate change from those that are impacted by, by climate change. Let it be a bottom-up approach as much as it should also be a top-bottom uh, top bottom approach because it is only those that suffer the consequences of climate change that need to speak for themselves, explain how they feel about it, and also offer the solutions that they think are relevant to their circumstances. With that, um, we have come to the end of uh, this session. I'm told that it's time up, and uh, thank you very much for uh, participating in this very insightful discussion. Thank you so much. I now call upon um, Sir Lawrence to um, come to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Ishmael, and thank you to Carlin and to our expert panelists for sharing these responses to and perspectives on the draft report. It is great to hear how the report the subcommittee's preliminary recommendations and their implications have resonated with different key stakeholders. Thanks to all of our audience members, both in person and online, for contributing to this important conversation. We'll now reserve a few minutes for BIFAB members to deliberate what they've heard throughout the day today and specifically this afternoon's recommendations. To lead that conversation, I welcome my BIFAD colleague, Dr. Ratan Lau. Ratan, you've been a champion of this work stream since its inception. I look forward to hearing what has resonated with you and with our fellow BIFAD members as well. Ratan. Please uh, have a few questions for the subcommittee. 20 seconds, if possible. Kathy, we begin with you. And 20 second answer from your side. Oh, that's tough for an answer. So we heard in the operational recommendations about the need for more financial resources, for more human, more human resources, but we also heard there's no new money for climate. So that made it all the more important that non-climate funding prog funded programs have to get on board. But as Jess knows better than anybody, try to talk to people about how fundamental nutrition is and they say, yeah, I agree with you as long as you don't touch my budget. So my question for the subcommittee is how would you incentivize the non-climate funded programs to get on board with your ambitious set of recommendations? Jess, would you like to respond to that? <laughs> um, it's such a good question, Kathy. I mean, I'm just thinking about the nutrition. You know, how would you convince the nutrition community to care about climate and be thinking about climate? It's, it's hard for me to answer that because I can't think of a world in where we're not thinking about climate and the immediacy. And it's so visceral this summer, as our colleague said, I don't know how you can't not consider it part of your programming at this point. It's quite naive if you think you can ignore it. And it's so central to all nutrition interventions from if you're thinking about through the diet pathway or through the infectious disease pathway. Um, I guess what I often spend a lot of my time doing as someone who thinks 
I guess some people have called me big picture on um, food systems. I spend a lot of time working with different sectors on how they can take a systems approach and how that systems approach can be very informative to their work and can lead them to maybe the trade-offs and the synergies of where they can work. And I sometimes feel like there's just a moment where people do sort of wake up and they, they understand and see that, but I think it's just consistent and constant exposure to these topics and where finding a place where you fit within it. Are you gonna solve it all? No, but you can find entry points where you can work. Um, I think it's also, when we're talking about climate, I think, let's say you are talking to a public health nutrition community and they're just like, okay, there's all this like projection data, what is all this? But it's also up to the climate community to provide climate information and climate services, and Ed knows this well, ensuring that that information can be translated for the public health practitioners to be able to do their job. So if there's a flood coming, how do you translate that data, make it relevant for the nutritionists to then stock up on ready to use therapeutic food in their clinics? So there has to be some dialogue around using climate data for different sectors outside of the meteorology and the climate scientist community. And that's really, really important. And a lot of people are doing work on that. It's bringing that data and these lofty projections that people don't understand and making it very tangible. And then they know where to act and when. So. Thank you, Jess. Thanks so much. Um, do you want to answer the same question? No, it's fine. I mean, we don't have enough time. No, it's OK. If I may, yeah. I, I think that a lot of the targets and indicators would apply to the non-climate programs as well. And, and so it's redirecting your, what you're trying to achieve within those programs. But also, I think, because budgets can be zero sum, reallocating some of the existing budget is also important, so not Thank locking you. into past programs. Thank you. Please, Andrew, go ahead. No, no, no. Oh, no. I was just sort of thinking about the answer in, in just a general sense, um, and this would be all of about 10 seconds, that usually when organizations sort of are faced with this issue, the, the, the decisions really do need to come from the top in order to sort of change priorities. If we can't change budgets and we have to change priorities, it really has to come from the top. Thank you. And yes, so <clears throat> a couple of things. I had something else to say until this conversation, but I think geopolitical is just going to get worse. And I think we really have to think about, you know, when you go out and talk to farmers, and this was my previous life at Corteva, they just don't necessarily believe in, in climate change. And so when you're talking to them, you can just kind of see it, see them kind of backing away from that. So I think that's one thing, to really consider how we talk about that. The other thing is, you know, I, I, my political or my corporate lens is on, you know, empowering women and youth has been, we've been talking about that for forever. And really empowerment, we're empowered, but we need money. <laughs> and so you can empower people, but the financing piece of that is really, you know, important and when you you go into communities I was just in India in March you know there's a real willingness to want to do smallholder farmer work it's the financing is the is the piece of it so what could we really do in in creating this to really help on the finance end with limited funding but knowing that there is a willing group of people women and and youth that want to get into this, but really need money to do that. So, so who would answer that question? Yes, sir. Yeah, the, 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 I think the point for me is that um, we really need to look at um, the youth as, as they're widely differentiated. Uh, some of them really don't require finance, uh, or they require finance for, for, for growth capital, or require finance uh, for, for other ways. But many others maybe require social grants that could also be used to, to 
to, to, to achieve environmental outcomes, as, as an example. So when we speak about the youth, we really need to look at their entire diversity. Otherwise, we are going to give them one instrument. I believe um, from where I come from that a lot of the youths are not necessarily clamoring for finance to, to, to do the things that they want to do. They are already doing it. And there is ample evidence for that from Southern Africa, at least that there are a lot of them already doing it. What they require maybe is much more information to help them do what they're doing much better than, than the actual finance. Of course, there are those that are going to require finance. I also believe that there's need for different types of finance. Philanthropic finance can also be there to, for training non-competitive uh, areas. It could be there for, for quantifying the volume of, um, as an example, carbon, uh, uh, carbon farming that can be achieved in Southern Africa just in putting investment profiles so that they can then use those to go and leverage financing from elsewhere. So we need to think a bit broader and, and much wider and, and use all different types of capital from philanthropy to, uh, to public uh, development financing. Thank you. I think I requested two of our board members to make recommendations. Lawrence? Uh, uh, yes, one thing I want to say is Sawita is also online. Uh, on, on, uh, uh, online. I did want to make one quick recommendation, and that is, um, <clears throat> and, and I, let me just say I'm very pleased and delighted. I mean, this was great. <laughs> it took me a while to go through it, but, but uh, lots of great suggestions. And I was looking in, under a research, uh, being that I'm coming from a university, uh, about uh, the, the, the amount of collaboration that's recommended, uh, not only with other institutions, not only with government, but communities, local relationships, and partnerships, corporate and otherwise. I think that's very, very important to have in there. But as a leader of an MSI, I've got to ask about uh, inclusion of, and, and how do we assure that MSIs are prominently included in the research that, and, and collaborations and partnerships going forward, especially since particularly those MSIs like mine uh, have these established relationships with these countries uh, and, 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 and could play a critical role as long as we include them. So just that's my question and I want to make sure that you know Sawit is on the line as well. Okay. Um, does anybody want to respond to? No? Sweda, are you online? Um, yes, I am. And Sweda, actually, um, Lawrence... You, I would request a, you to okay. make some recommendation that you think are appropriate and have not been addressed. Um, well, actually, I, I, just, I wanted to, first of all, sort of appreciate the, the subcommittee. Um, I really, really enjoyed reading the report. And I really appreciated the, the recommendations from the subcommittee on, on the research and actually wanted to just quickly talk about two areas that I particularly resonated with, again, being someone from a research um, university. And the one is, is linked to something that Lawrence just said, which is this idea of the need to work more with private sector um, partners to be able to sort of crowd in investment, solicit complementary expertise, and sort of identify um, interventions that are potentially scalable so there's recent evidence that has actually shown that um, micro, small, and medium scale enterprises in the midstream and the downstream of input and output supply chains in developing regions are a key source of innovation um, in the developing regions, but there's not as much understood about the nature of those innovations. The extent to which those innovations are actually transformative or can be transformative. So I was very happy to see suggestions um, on the research side for more research on there. I do believe that there's a significant um, room for us to learn um, more and many of these uh, private sector-led initiatives are more sustainable, and they're by they're led by these innovations are led by people who understand the context and are not necessarily waiting for the government to do what they're supposed to do. In many developing countries, they're not. Um, and then the second has to do with um, again this issue of working with communities. I think when we talk about climate impacts, I think that um, <clears throat> it's really important because. Um, community scale collective action is, is really going to be necessary for building resilience um, to changing climate regimes. But not much is known about you know, how this can, you know, takes place in developing regions, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, and how that might be scaled up and supported. So I really wanted to, to mention um, those two areas. The one um, question that I had for the subcommittee, um, or maybe a reflection, or I would have loved to hear more, um, just has to do with um, this recommendation for, for the long-term 
um, time scale. So the report sort of um, recommended that um, USAID project designers should extend the time scale of the climate um, analysis and also the um, expected investment outcomes beyond the activity implementation period. And so I was just kind of wondering what are the thoughts about whose responsibility that would be? Is it the missions? Um, and given that the projects are usually, you know, five years or you know, have a short lifespan and these are very long-term, um, you know, outcomes, um, who is, an, you know, is there some capacity that needs to be built to, to get that done? Sweta, you know, th here. thanks, Sweta. I know it's a very important thing, discussion. But uh, I would like you to join me in thanking the subcommittee and by far member to follow 22nd recommendation that I have made. Thank you. Thank you, Ratan. Before we adjourn, I have the honor of facilitating a very important moment in today's agenda. On behalf of the full board, I would like to recognize the subcommittee members for their service over the past year. In our early planning for this important work, we recognized that we needed a team of global experts with deep experience and diverse viewpoints to advise the board. The board appreciates each member for sharing your tremendous expertise, dedicating your time and energy, and answering the call when BIFAD and USA reached out for your technical leadership. As a demonstration of our appreciation, I am pleased to present certificates to each of you. If I can ask Lini, Ishmael, Andrew, and Jess to please return to the stage. Lini, you have dedicated countless hours over the past year guiding the team, the study team, and facilitating knowledge sharing and, and knowledge sharing and consensus building among the subcommittee. And we'd like to say thank you for your work. Andrew, Dr. Andrew Muhammad. Dr. Jessica Fanzo. Ishmael Sunga. I also want to acknowledge the subcommittee members who could not be here today, but whose contributions have been invaluable. Subcommittee co-chair. Aaron, Aaron Coughlin de Perez at the Freeman School of Nutrition, Tufts University. Uh, Carlin Nguyen, who's not here now, uh, co-founder of Climate Action Platform for Africa. Daniela Shirak at the Climate Policy Initiative. Chenea Juliet. Jaza from the Climate Smart Agricultural Youth Network, Mario Herrero, professor in the Department of Global Development and, and Director of Food Systems and Global Change. He had to leave. Uh, Sophia Hoyer from the International Livestock Research Center, Peter Wright from CARE USA, Mauricio Benitez from Responsibility Investments AJ Switzerland, Juan Ecove from Care USA and Angelino Vachesa.
from Spelman College. Thank you again. I would also like to thank the author team for its expertise, professionalism, and adaptability, especially Ed Carr and Rahel Dero. As we look ahead to next steps, please remember that the written public comment period for the report and preliminary recommendation shared today is open through next Monday, September 18th. Instructions for commenting are provided online and on the slide. Following the public comment period, the subcommittee and author team will work together to finalize the report so that the subcommittee can submit its formal recommendations to BIFAD next month. The board will review these and share final recommendations to the agency in time to inform USAID's engagements at the 28th Conference of Parties in November. Finally, one last point of business before we adjourn. BIFAD is accepting member nominations for the proposed Subcommittee on Minority Serving Institutions, or MSIs. Engagement and leadership in USAID's agricultural, food security, and nutrition policies and programming. The proposed subcommittee will inform recommendations to strengthen USAID's partnerships with MSIs and identify opportunities for USAID. For USAID to engage the higher education community to develop a diverse pipeline of future professionals in global food security, nutrition, and agriculture development. The draft subcommittee's terms of reference is posted online at usaid.gov slash BIFAD. The nomination period ends this Friday, September 15th. For more information, please see a BIFAD member or our support team colleagues. And now, we've reached the end of today's meeting. I would like to thank the people who worked hard to make today's program a success. First, Clara Cohen and USAID colleagues. Thank you, Claire. Reed Hamill, Rachel Helbig, Tommy Crocker, Katie Nave, Megan Knight, and Carmen Benson at TetraCheck. And once again, thank you all in the room and online for joining today and sharing your perspectives to inform what I anticipate will be bold and impactful recommendations. We are adjourned.